to the new Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news on the local Colorado economy and initiatives that focus on the development of cybersecurity economics. You don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert to get plugged in. Your host, Chris Gorog, brings it straightforward, asks the tough questions, and brings the cyber world to a level of understanding for everyone. Chris is personable and opens up with our guests on issues we all would like to see addressed. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join our host as he introduces the topic for today's New Cyber Frontier. Welcome everyone to the New Cyber Frontier. My name is Sean Murray. We have a special guest with us today, Tim Montgomery. Uh, Tim's a cybersecurity engineer at Jacobs Engineering, assigned to the Missile Defense Agency out at Shreer Air Force Base as an Information Systems Security Officer, ISSO. Welcome, Tim. Hi. How are you doing? Good, good. Hey, we appreciate you, you know, taking some time out and coming down to uh, talk to us today, but who's Tim? Who's Tim Montgomery? Uh, you know, how did you get into this career field of information, cybersecurity, and, and you know, how how did you get to where you're at today? Uh, military, you know. Okay. Um, a lot of background in military. Um, came from a military family. Um, kind of got into technology through high school, so kind of blended together as I uh, got into signal uh, in the army. Okay. And kind of went from back in the days when telecom was big into blending of the computers industries into the new uh, Cisco products for the communications assets in the Army. So okay. that kind of went into uh, going to school to get security, a uh, master's in security, uh, which also led into more computers. So as computers started to evolve, started blending into more of the systems, uh, in the military, I got my hands deeper and deeper into connecting uh, how technology start to change. So with that, and the government, the DOD itself, of course that brought on uh, the precedence to make systems more secure. So, and so you transitioned out of the military. What happened then? Um, actually, I, I kind of stayed with the National Guards for a very long time, um, and I got my master's degree. And then uh, about 2015 or so, um, I w I've been a contractor for a few years now and uh, kind of went back and forth overseas and um, got with the uh, Missile Defense Agency out of Shriver and uh, ended up in a group of uh, well-qualified individuals helping with the cybersecurity uh, requirements there and got into projects and uh, system engineering kind of lends hand to getting me into cyber more and more and more as we went along. So uh, eventually I've moved over into actually doing cyber uh, permanently and of course with the background and the skill set of a system engineer, system infrastructure changes, uh, understand IT services, kind of blends together very well to understand how cyber can impact uh, a live system and its operations. You know, we've talked about this in previous programs as well. Uh, what do you feel uh, about person, many disciplines, right, in, in cybersecurity, and uh, in some of those disciplines, uh, an organization uh, can be uh, more uh, successful when the, its staff has a, a good technical background, growing up in the industry as an IT or sysadmin, uh, oh, yeah. uh, database administrator, software engineering, having an understanding of the technology is the point, right? How does that contribute to the success of somebody who wants to be a cybersecurity uh, person in, in any of those disciplines? Well, I'll tell you two things, technology itself and understanding kind of how the systems integrate uh, components. You know, in the system, you've got network devices and you've got uh, your end user uh, parts that connect together and then you've got just the cabling itself, the physical structure, and then you've got your actually management, your services, which um, in include servers. So understanding how they integrate, how services move across, um, how uh, firewalls impact day-to-day uh, -day operations or services, even logging into uh, a client or a desktop um, can impact you if it doesn't get over and get authenticated correctly. So especially in the DoD. Um, today, you know, it's not as simple as a password and a username. You actually have to have a card. Um, a couple of things. So uh, I could see how 
understanding how skills, things drive together. Um, also, communications. Um, your project managers, I think, need to have some technical background, along with, especially with your cybersecurity people. Um, I, on a daily basis, I could think of how I need to explain uh, how security can apply to a system more securely through the means of technology. Um, I do help explain in a lot of ways to most directors, uh, to upper management a lot of times, how the impact of cyber can help them versus hinder them. And I think that kind of, uh, the mentality that comes out of some people believe that first off. So we get a cultural change if you understand how technology can drive security versus security trying to hinder technology in this way. Well, it's a really good point. So uh, we're going to come back with Tim Montgomery. Uh, we're going to take a break right now, and we'll be right back. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. All right, welcome back, uh, New Cyber Frontier. My name is Sean Murray. I'm the host for this uh, afternoon session. Our special guest is Tim Montgomery, who's a cybersecurity engineer at Jacobs Engineering, assigned to the Missile Defense Agency here at uh, Shriver Air Force Base as an ISSO, Information Systems Security Officer. Uh, we were talking about the importance of uh, having a good technical background in some of the disciplines of cybersecurity. You know, in, in your, your, a lot of your career has been focused uh, uh, military or government, government contractor working for the Defense Department in the United States. Um, you know, one of the things that we get a lot of questions on, uh, a lot of listeners will ask what it takes to be successful in working for the federal government in, 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 our, in our career field. What are the things that, uh, that we look at as far as qualifications uh, to be able to go to work for the government, say as a, a defense contractor in cybersecurity? Well, a lot of times, uh, especially in Jacobs, uh, the contract I'm currently on in the Missile Defense Agency, uh, they're very heavy into uh, the DOD Regulation 8570. Um, and if, if people out there are not sure, quite sure what that might be, um, it kind of sets the level of precedence uh, as far as what you need to be as a skill set, depending on what your uh, access level, I guess you could say it is, uh, more or less privilege levels. When you come into a system as an admin, oftentimes you will need privileges to do administrative activities or tasks. Um, and so when you get hired by a company like uh, Jacobs, uh, they oftentimes will uh, give you the duty set or the task that you have if those require you to have privileges to complete or uh, work with every day, then you're going to require a certification uh, according to the 8570. So is that a professional <coughs> certification? What kind of certification? I don't know, most of the time it is professional. Um, I think most of us kind of see it day to day and, and become more common. Security Plus uh, for, let's say, just pick one of the categories in 8570, the IAT Level 2. That's what most of us are commonly used to. We come in, we're system admins, we do uh, client-based or server-based type tasking, and um, we require a Security Plus. So Security Plus is a commercial industry standard certification, um, which you can get through uh, many campuses, uh, SecureSet being one of those, or your company, um, the Murray service, uh, Services, Security Services. <coughs> and um, from there, that would qualify you to be able to have the privilege to count. Um, and access to do those tasks. Also, there's another part in 8570 that some people don't may not realize, and that's the computing environment certification, or the commonly referred to CE. Um, and so, let's say you're a Windows administrator, then you're going to require some kind of Microsoft certification, or if you're a Unix or Linux type uh, tasking that you've got, is going to be more or less the Red Hat on that side of things. Um, today, um, the DoD as it stands, 
I don't think they really enforce the CE part of it, but they certainly are starting to uh, will not hire contractors cannot hire unless they have that that IET level two certification according to the category you were hired for. I guess you'd say on that eighty five seventy. And that's yeah, and so uh, the Department of Defense uh, uh, 8570 falls under the 8140 right. uh, directive that articulates a specific body of knowledge or understanding of technology. And uh, you're talking about IAT or Information Assurance Technology level uh, 1, 2, or 3. The higher the, the number, the higher that proficiency that you're talking about, right? So that, that, uh, that certification. Are there any additional requirements uh, other than, uh, say, the, the computing environment served or that cybersecurity certification? Uh, if, if I'm coming to you and I'm asking, what, what else do I need other than that? Say I've got that. <clears throat> what else do I need to have? Well, nine times out of ten, when you take a look at some of these job recs, uh, in, at least in Jacobs, because I can speak for Jacobs and some of the other companies I've worked for, uh, you're looking at years of experience. So they oftentimes are going to look to see if you've got experience in specific things, uh, the risk management framework is uh, fairly common in the DOD as it is. So that's something they ask for, quote unquote, RMF experience, if you will. Um, and that's more to pertain to accreditations of, of your system uh, with authorized users or authorized, the authorizing officer that AO is referred to. Um, so experience is is generally what people are going to look for. Three to five years of security experience is kind of what they're looking for with additional experience behind project management skills or you can get into uh, um, into technical skills and we have kind of talked a little bit about Linux or Linux side of the house or you get into uh, Windows side of the house type of things. So skills and those technical skills usually three to five years is usually what we, we tend to have to look for. Um, your degrees also is a plus. Um, these days, they actually will uh, look for people who actually have some kind of degree from a university or college, uh, four year, and then your master's degree, of course. Um, certainly, will take those into consideration as preferences. So, just a couple other things beyond the 8570s. So, as a supervisor, what would be the day to day activities working in your organization? as a cybersecurity person working on your team? So I am uh, a part of a small group that does testing uh, for the MDA. And uh, we have currently have three systems that we group together. Um, and I have everything from scanning a system to patching a system uh, to going in and troubleshooting for an end client or an end user. Um, a workstation or desktop um, to governance and governance I mean when it comes to the RMF um, is basically writing documentation uh, working with the program management the upper chain the management chain um, um, processes for your engineer set uh, interacting with project management skills uh, to actually review projects to see if they set compliancy measures within the design or the infrastructure changes that might CABs or um, change review boards. I sit on those on a day-to-day -day basis. So lots of activities. Um, this small group of people uh, compose of probably about 12, 12 to 16 of us. And I actually have another functional manager that actually does the operations and infrastructure piece of it with me. Um, I primarily do all the sit-in for management and and kind of uh, sit down and try to uh, help them understand where their money's going. Um, it's a lot of fun there. Um, but anything you can think of uh, that drives how uh, security can be implied to technology and IT infrastructure. When you, you describe several <coughs> mature processes that make up of a, a more of a mature program, you talked about um, you know, risk management board and, and you know, change management board. So those mature policies, plans, procedures, a lot more mature in uh, the government side than uh, we see sometimes on the commercial side. Yeah, I agree. I think um, specifically for the MDA out of the six agencies I've had the privilege of working for over the past 20 years or so, I've seen the uh, Missile Defense Agency probably be one of the best uh, change management, uh, change requests, documenting how it changes. 
uh, and being able to show a track record of or history of the system in its life cycle. So let's talk about something that um, that's a little bit more uh, non-mature. Uh, pervasive technologies, up and coming, uh, current technologies, providing lots of capabilities on the commercial side, not easily adaptable uh, to the government side. Uh, technologies like blockchain, um, uh, IoT, you know, Internet of Things, um, autonomous vehicles, you know, driving themselves, yeah. artificial intelligence. Do you see any of that technology being implemented on the government side? There are some things starting to trend, um, I would say. Uh, it's, I want to say from what I've, what I've got a chance to see there's in its embassy. Um, there are some uh, agencies out there, though, I guarantee you, DARPA's uh, projects within some of the universities I've seen um, are starting to blend how military might use something like that, uh, like blockchain. In, in autonomous vehicles, we've seen drones, uh, first-hand experience in Iraq, some of the drones to help protect us uh, from the oncoming uh, missiles and things of that nature. So, been the uh, privilege of being saved by a drone uh, in a fog. So, that's that. So good experience, right? right? Exactly. Good example. <laughs> exactly. So you know, you're uh, you also participate outside of uh, the government in various activities. You're an instructor at a local college, a new university here, as a uh, a professor. You're also involved in uh, uh, blockchain technology, where you're a contributor to that body right. of knowledge. Um, you know, how rewarding are those experiences? And, and give us a little bit of background on, on what you're doing in those areas. Well, the university I work for, uh, I think. The, uh, the reward for me is watching uh, individuals connect the dots. Um, it's one of the biggest uh, pleasures I think anyone who teaches can have, uh, being able to put the knowledge out there, um, trying to strive to gain a pool of individuals skilled uh, to be able to drive the workforce. I know that uh, the statistics are alarming as far as how many positions are out there and how short we are uh, as far as cybersecurity or information uh, security or information assurance professionals, um, however you want to put it there. Um, but yeah, that, I'd say we're working diligently at trying to uh, come up with ways to support uh, gaining individuals and helping them get skills that would be more appropriate uh, as far as what the requirements are in the DOD. Um, so certain universities do have 24-week uh, programs, uh, other universities have supported helping uh, companies interact and drive the pool of individuals to be skilled. And of course, uh, like your company does, it actually supports the boot camps and instructors uh, to be able to help people gain that knowledge and get certified um, here and locally. So um, I just say that uh, it, oftentimes it, it, it's, it's people who want to drive. They, they're the ones who want to come in and do they have a hunger, and they just need somebody to, to show them. Direct that energy. Yeah, to get that energy in there and get it flowing. And, and the industry for cyber is exploding across the board. And uh, I just think it's a great time to be in cyber. Yeah, it's, it's just one of, those, uh, one of those areas where we, there's just so much happening. Um, you know, there's just not enough uh, people in the industry feeding uh, those requirements. Um, and the way that we look at it from a, an academic perspective, be able to help contribute from a practitioner's viewpoint right. to, and contribute to the academic setting where this is maybe how you're reading it uh, in, the, in, the, in the field manual, but these are the expectations right. that I got in the real world. That's how you not apply the it in real way. life. Right. Yeah. All right, so we're going to come back uh, and talk to Tim Montgomery some more. Uh, this is Sean Murray with the New Cyber Frontier. We're going to break for our sponsor. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. 
Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. Welcome back, uh, Sean Murray, New Cyber Frontier. Our special guest today is Tim Montgomery, Cybersecurity Engineer at Jacobs Engineering, assigned to the Missile Defense Agency as an ISSO, Information System Security Officer. Uh, you know, we were talking at, at the break time about uh, blockchain, and blockchain is not just cryptocurrencies. There's there's so much there's more, so much more smart you cities about. and, yeah. and cryptocurrencies and illegal documents. Uh, yeah, it's a good way to trade without anonymously um, to be able to any type of trade or retail, any type of mechanism that uh, would uh, prevent individuals from understanding how uh, who someone is and do it in a way where um, it has integrity, not repudiation. So, um, yeah, the blockchain industry is just starting out and, it, and it's very, it, not a lot of applications at this point. Uh, and of course, we all know Bitcoin, uh, it seems to be where you hear about blockchain itself, but uh, blockchain is so much more than that. Um, applications that we're not even aware of yet. and. Hopefully, I'll get my chance uh, in a university here to get my stab at uh, kind of developing some of those to help uh, uh, answer some questions on how applications. Um, I'm kind of looking at ideas for the retail industry, e-commerce itself, how the transactions between uh, your normal individual average user or device-to-device -device type methods um, as far as security levels go with secure methods for transactions to buy something online. We all know that uh, a lot of the industry now, even the small businesses, which surprisingly if we don't catch on with them, we're, they're going to end up being kind of the outside, if you will, uh, from what's going to take place here, especially considering we're moving to the internet for more of our purchases and more of the e-commerce is getting bigger and bigger, less of that block and uh, building mortar type situations where you can walk into a building and and actually see something. Um, so as we trend there more and more, this blockchain is going to become even more precedent for that type of uh, activity. Yeah, you, you, you know, the last time I, I bought a house, uh, we bought a few rental properties. You know, I, I'm used to going down and meeting with everyone at the table for right. four hours worth of scribbling my illegible signature Correct. on documents. <laughs> We're not doing that anymore. No. What right. is you know, so what does blockchain bring to the table? You know, we talk about the ledger, we talk about the software, we talk about that chain of trust. Um, how does that make an organization, considering that type of technology, uh, how would you sell that? Um, I would say that um, it gives the capability for you to have a, a means to do something where you don't have to go through that manual process. So you brought the example of the mortgage course. Uh, and the painstaking measures of uh, uh, basically breaking a pin over all the documentations. So with trust there, um, um, it makes the process even faster, um, makes it more digitized. Things can be now, um, can be signed repeatedly with one type of signature uh, with a type of integrity that we know we can trust. Uh, blockchain is certainly one of those pieces of technologies that can implement that. Um, at those bases. Um, when you trade, when you trade money, when you you have uh, corporations who want to lock into agreements, uh, certainly blockchain can be evident to support a way to be able to trust one another and build that trust through that contract. Um, I think of my taxes um, and going and do my taxes and being able to do it online and going through uh, an artificial intelligence, uh, I think that's coming too. Uh, instead of seeing a person. Now, what will that do to the industry for those individuals who... Have uh, unique problems? Right, or, yeah. right, correct. And how would you... I'm sure that we'll get into that idea of being able to transfer over uh, communication lines to the Internet uh, to advisors through not having to get in a car and drive somewhere, but being able to do it from your house through uh, the trust methods that blockchain will bring. So... You know, one of the, one of the things that... Uh, we sometimes hear regarding one of the challenges associated with blockchain is uh, it's blockchain is software and so we know that the number one most significant threat to uh, any industry is the human number two is is software assurance All right. how does that apply to blockchain 
And, and so when we talk about that trust, we understand how the concept is. What about vetting the software that's developed uh, for that blockchain application for whatever it's developed for? Um, I know there's methods to go through and it, you're talking about the infrastructure itself, there's certain methods that we can go through to make sure. But the blockchain, um, you can't, the integrity that's built, the way it's built, you certainly can't mess with it once it starts. Um, there's just no way, it's almost a continuous measure. Once it's, once it's gone into motion, it's kind of one of those things you can't disrupt. It has other methods and ways to kind of bend itself around when something happens. Um, but once you get the existence in there, and there's trust, and you, it, it's, it sets out, you really can't stop from, from the use of it after yeah, it's been Federated trust from yeah. the ledger, right? Right, the ledger itself, it, you can't manipulate it. If it does, it has, it has contingencies built into it. And it's anonymous once it starts, depending on how it's built, but right. uh, most of it, yeah. It's interesting how it works. Yeah, so just another one of those uh, uh, pervasive technologies that I think uh, um, we're going to see a lot more in our industry. Um, nobody wants to go down to the bank anymore. Nobody wants to go down and <laughs> sign a whole bunch of documents. At this uh, point, you won't have to. <laughs> at, it's what, in, it's, at some point, you'll, there'll be an application on your phone where you can just whiz through it as yeah, well. Yeah, it'll be a thing of the past. I, you know, I have uh, children, and uh, as we sit down and talk about the ledger, doing your checking checkbook, and my oldest still does, still writes everything down just because it's easy easier that way or that method, but these days, I mean, you can actually have an application, uh, if the integrity is right, you can actually have one that actually shows you spending methods, does all that right inside your bank account for you, so I mean, and do all the transactions right there at the interface of, the, of your web browser, so it'll be interesting to see what comes out of it. Yeah, I uh, appreciate your contributions, we'll have to do a follow-up uh, at, at some later sure. point. As, as we get more mature into this technology. Um, three to five years, what do you think? I always ask this question in, in my interviews. Yeah, three yeah. to five years, so where are we? Interview question. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I, a, but it's it your is. typical trick. It, uh, it is, because I, I like to get people's <clears throat> perspective. There is so much happening. We're, we're putting people through an academic program for technologies that haven't even been developed. We were talking about quantum computing. IBM stored uh, two years ago where it was able to store one bit of data on an atom. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to you know, do computing at the atomic level. Um, three to five years, where are we? What challenges do you think we're, we're going to be faced with? Well, five years out, I think we're, uh, well, the slow rise of cyber anyway, uh, and the technology as it's moving at the rate in which you're explained there, uh, we're going to be playing catch up. Um, we always devise, are, right? <laughs> yeah, we've got to devise a way to, to bring about uh, a lot better means. Um, I saw an article over Cyber Library, Cyberry, um, and it was talking about the automations, the impact of automations. Uh, I know that uh, Maccabee's been working some of these things, uh, entertaining projects in the DoD to support uh, a anonymous way for the client itself to kind of understand uh, through its own means because it's a conscious connection to all the other devices, you know, the mesh topology. Um, but Maccabee has uh, something similar to that coming out uh, if they haven't already come out in most industries to support uh, detecting uh, certain ambiguous or uh, virus detection type measures and then feeding that information up to make it calculated risk and then and allowing a person to, to say yes or no to that and then it basically building right inside the library and spin it right back out to all the other clients it's instantly protected within hours so um, I think that's going to be a, a major thing that's going to have a big role in the play of how we do things um, also the method that we're going to use to kind of connect to devices I think um, it's coming down the pike too, so that would support uh, your ability to identify, being able to identify with certain factors inside uh, when you log into a place. And of things, um, that boggles my mind some days of how the DOD might be implying certain things of that nature. 
um, but with virtualization coming and the way virtualization impacted how the desktop performed, um, I think they'll pick up steadily on that factor. So, Yeah, doing more with less, one of the things that we're starting to see, especially on the government side, is uh, moving into the Gov Cloud. It's right. going to reduce significantly the amount of money or capital investment that the government has to spend and if you can virtualize an environment um, or you can uh, request capacity at whatever level, software as a service, right? right. Um, network as a service, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, you know, that's going to contribute uh, significantly. Right. The other aspect of it, the GovCloud is a single accrediting authority, so that certification accreditation process yeah. will lie within DISA. Right. So now as if you're a defense contractor and you don't want to have to focus on that, you want to focus on whatever your right. contribution you is in engineering. Service. <laughs> what, so what do you think? Well, I, it's moving. So um, as far as quantum computing, things of that nature coming in, I'm sure it's got its place. Uh, I just haven't seen it in the little small area that I've that I've been sitting in for the past few years. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the Gov Cloud itself, or the idea of a military or mail cloud, if you will, um, the emphasis of virtualization, things of that nature will help that blend in almost as well. And you wouldn't know the difference between the government side of things and the commercial side of things at some point, which is a plus for the government itself. Um, hopefully that also uh, brings down the number of requirements for as many cybersecurity professionals. Um, there's still going to be an abundance need for it, but that'll help alleviate, I hope, some of that measure. Um, the big impact is going to be to more of the smaller businesses. I think we're going to have to find a good way to bring them into the cloud or, or help them with a service that they can uh, utilize at their levels. I agree. Well, you know, this is a great time to wrap up. Um, you know, we've been speaking with Tim Montgomery, cybersecurity engineer at Jacobs Engineering, assigned to uh, the Missile Defense Agency. Um, Tim, hey, thanks for coming down yeah, and, and sharing you. some of your experience with us. Uh, you know, love to follow up with you uh, maybe in a, a year or so and, and see where you're at and sure. what's going on. That sounds good. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, this is Sean Murray with the New Cyber Frontier. Uh, thank you again, Tim. Thank you for having me. enjoyed this episode of New Cyber Frontier. Remember to get involved. Often we think that someone else will handle privacy and security in the virtual world, but you are the only one truly in command of your virtual fate. Join our mailing list so we can keep you informed of breaking news and new releases. If you have an idea, if you have a question that you would like to hear answered, or if you want to get involved with our efforts, reach out to us at NewCyberFrontier.com. We also encourage you to visit our sponsors' links as they are the ones that really make this show possible. I want to thank each of you for supporting the show, and we look forward to seeing you back for the next episode of New Cyber Frontier. <laughs>